Welcome to this Introduction to Counselling Skills. This is the first module on Personal Motivations and Self-Development. Before we start Module 1, I just wanted to give you an outline of what the whole course covers. This introductory course aims to give you a basic understanding of what counselling is, what kind of skills you're going to need to develop and how to work safely to protect yourself and the people that you're helping. So by the end of the course, you'll be able to understand why it's important that you reflect on your own motivations for helping others, understanding why self-development is so important, understanding some of the basics of three key theories, also developing your understanding of what the core conditions of counselling are and the core counselling skills that you'll need to develop. You'll also gain an understanding of what the ethical frameworks are and how you need to work within the law. It also covers the importance of supervision. And then finally, there's a review and recap and a process that you need to go through to think about what your next steps are. Hi, my name's Fiona. I thought it might be useful for you to find out a little bit about me um, and also about my motivations for developing this course. Um, first of all, just to say that um, I've always been interested in the connection between our physical and mental health. Um, and so I set up my own practice um, to include both psychological and physical therapies. So I'm a qualified counsellor, hypnotherapist. Um, I also do NLP, for those of you that know what that is, um, neuro-linguistic programming. Um, I also do complementary therapies, so things like massage, aromatherapy, reflexology. Um, and I've been really interested in how the combination of some of these therapies can really help people um, feel more positive about themselves and make some decisions about the kind of life that they want to have. Um, I support lots of different clients with lots of different issues from anxiety, bereavement, um, stress, recovery from trauma um, and also helping support people making lifestyle changes, whether that's about what they eat, exercise or addictions. The simple act of listening to someone else, um, one human being to another, can be really powerful. Um, many people don't have someone they can talk to honestly about how they're feeling. So for me, I thought this course would be important um, if there are people like yourself out there who are thinking about a helping profession um, and about how rewarding it can be. Um, it's so important that more people get into these professions to help support our communities. Um, I really hope you enjoy the course. Thank you. So in this module, you're going to cover two key areas. The first one is about reflecting on your own motivations to help others. And secondly, to help you understand why self-development is so important if you're going to embark on a career of counselling. So why do you want to learn counselling skills? Well, people are motivated for a whole host of reasons to embark on a helping relationship and applying counselling skills within their life, either personally or within a career. Some of these motivations are positive and practical, whilst others may be harmful potentially to both the helper and the client. We're going to explore what these motivations might be and for you, it's important that you begin to reflect on why you're interested in helping others. This understanding of yourself is so important and will help you decide whether a career path in counselling is the right path for you. As I've said, some of the motivations that people have about getting into a helping profession or being a counsellor are good. Some of these motivations are very positive and altruistic. Altruism is when you approach something in a selfless way to the benefit of another person. People who are altruistic often describe themselves as being in tune with other people, being sensitive to the feelings of others, being sensitive to the thoughts and life experiences of other people. Altruistic communication includes being kind, affectionate and considerate to other people. An altruistic helper prizes their clients for who they are and they help them to reach their potential, whatever this might be. Explanations of why people are altruistic vary quite a lot. Some believe 
It's an innate part of being a human being. It's something that you're born with. Others believe it comes from how you've been nurtured, how you've been brought up and socialised with the people who cared for you from birth. Others believe it comes from when a person takes responsibility for their own mental and spiritual development. It's about looking after your own well-being and continually working on improving your thoughts and actions and purifying the mind through self-development. Others believe it only comes from when you have made peace with the past, when you've made peace with past psychological pains and negative experiences that you've perhaps had. Motivations for entering a helping profession can also be pragmatic. Some motivations might come from the fact that you deal with things in a very pragmatic way. You consider yourself to be sensible, realistic and a practical person. You may think you're the right kind of person to help others. You may be emotionally intelligent and can recognise emotions in yourself and other people. You may want to earn a living through helping others because it gives you satisfaction and it fits with you personally. You might be someone who's responsible, helpful, curious, insightful and a kind person. For others, the skills may enhance your role and enable you to gain promotions and career progression through helping. OK, so we've talked about the good and the pragmatic reasons why people enter a helping profession. Now I need to talk to you about the potentially harmful motives people may have for helping others. These potentially harmful motives for helping others sometimes lie in the hidden agenda some people have. This is about the benefits sought in the helping relationship, which only serve the helper and the client's needs are not met. Being honest and truthful about why you really want to help others is a really important part of learning and applying counselling skills. You need to ask yourself, do I prize the needs of the person I'm helping and accept that they are independent and different from me with their own wants and desires and their own needs to develop in their own way. The kind of things you need to watch out for in yourself and other helpers include things like using the helping relationship to work on your own unresolved emotional pain or issues. Using the relationship because you have a strong desire to dominate or control someone else. The I know best kind of attitude. Other things to watch for include a very strong desire to fix someone else. Some people's negative motives may be that they need approval and they need to be liked by other people. In some cases, the helping relationship enables them to gain the intimacy or indeed sex from a helping relationship. This includes spending more time with someone helping them because actually it makes you feel more attractive and you like the attention. Another thing to watch out for is whether you have a victim mentality and if you're encouraging your client to adopt the same outlook, for example, you might be stuck in a negative personal or external circumstances and you may encourage the client to see their circumstances in the same way as yours. Self-reflection and self-development are critically important and they are a lifelong pursuit, essential if you want to become a competent and skilled helper or counsellor. This involves being honest about your motivations, which is not always easy, and sometimes it can be even uncomfortable or painful to admit. It's about consciously working on improving your limitations, improving your mindset, and being open to accepting other people with an open heart. The rewards can be great, when you're able to know yourself and face your own emotional or psychological pain and move forward from it. This is the first model I'm going to introduce you to and it's called the Johari window. This model was developed in 1955 by Joseph Luft and Harry Ingham. This model always makes me smile as these two friends dedicated the name of the model using both of their names, Joe and Harry. I always thought it was something very technical a term, but actually it's two friends joining their names together. Quite apt really for self-development. This model is used 
in many different areas of coaching, of personal development and self-development. You'll see this time and time again. I want to explain each of the windows so that you can understand how this model will help your self-development. OK, we're going to look at the first of the windows. This is the open area of the model, and it's about things you know about yourself to be true and that other people, if they are asked about you, would say the same thing that they have seen, observed or experienced it. So, for example, I know that I'm a kind person. And if you were to ask my friends and family, they would say I was a kind person as well. The second window is the hidden area. These are traits or attitudes that I know are true about myself, but are not known to other people. For example, I sometimes have negative thoughts about myself, which make it hard for me to speak in public. Others around me would be surprised to hear that because I hide it so well and others would think that I'm a confident and self-assured person whenever I speak in public. The third window is the blind area. The blind area is when others see something in us and yet we cannot see it for ourselves. For example, I might put myself out for another person and want to help them because it feels like the right thing to do. Others around me recognise that this desire to help is part of my desire to be liked and needed. When they tell me this, I might be taken aback or surprised or perhaps feel very defensive. This final window is called the unknown area. This is when we do not know something about ourselves and others around us do not know this aspect of us either. People that we help or support may uncover unknown things about us as they share their stories and sometimes we can have a strong reaction, a reaction that sometimes we're surprised at. This is where we need to work on ourselves and develop our understanding of what makes us who we are. For example, I may consider myself to be a fair and honest person, but if a client discloses a particular lifestyle that's at odds with my own, I might be shocked or judge them for how they live. I may be surprised at my own reaction. I then need to reflect on this reaction and help myself understand why this might be the case. Reflection is so important because it helps us know ourselves better and helps us understand how our own values and beliefs impact on our ability to support someone else. And it also affects our ability to be genuine towards them and not judge them against our own standards and values. The whole point of self-development is to increase the size of the open area. One way of enlarging the open area is through self-disclosure. This is a give and take process between me and other people I interact with. By receiving feedback from others and reflecting on our own behaviours and responses so that we can try and understand ourselves better, the open area will expand. As I share something about myself, I move information from my hidden area into the open area. We also gain knowledge about ourselves by receiving feedback from others. And this enables me to learn more about an aspect of myself that I'm unaware of and therefore I'm moving information from my blind area quadrant into the open area. As I share more and gain more information about myself, I can begin to gain insights through reflection about aspects of myself that both I and others are unaware of. Things like impulses that drive us, motives and instincts, values and beliefs, and those less tangible things that we just accept but haven't given much thought to. These insights help move information from the unknown area into the open. The Johari window is a really useful model to apply as part of our own personal development, encouraging self-reflection and self-awareness and being open to constructive feedback. Being truly comfortable about our inner world can enable us to genuinely accept ourselves and by accepting ourselves, we can accept others. By doing this, we can be open to support other people and accept them as they truly are without judgment. 
Without adopting this approach to self-development, we can cause harm to those we're trying to support because they may feel rejected and judged by us. So how can we develop as human beings and how do we develop our skills as counsellors? Each of us have different experiences and those experiences shape how we see the world and how we see ourselves in it. Our mindset is so important and it influences how we're able to grow intellectually or remain fixed at a point in time. If we have a fixed mindset, we might be fearful of receiving feedback from others about our skills and abilities. We may receive others' observations of us as an attack, as a judgment, as a failure, and sometimes we feel very bruised and hurt by the things people say. But if we begin to develop an open mindset, we will be able to grow and develop our skills beyond anything we thought was possible. I personally do not believe that we are destined to remain in a fixed mindset due to our upbringing or previous experiences. I do accept though that if you have a fixed mindset that this can make it harder to change, but change does and can happen. If you open yourself up to those experiences, even if you're afraid, and it can and does get easier with practice. If you're embarking on a career in counselling or indeed any career in a helping profession, developing a growth mindset is an important part because throughout your work, you'll be getting feedback from clients, your supervisor, your manager and others who observe your working. Receiving this information with an open mind will enable you to learn about yourself, recognise the different skills you had and perhaps even surprise you about things people notice that you didn't even know you had. And it can help you to pinpoint and address areas you want to change or improve. This will benefit the people you're supporting and it will also benefit you and how you live your life if you let it. Okay, just a quick recap on what we've covered so far. First of all, we looked at the importance of understanding your own motivations to help others. In the pack and the information that I've sent you, there's a questionnaire that's really important for you to fill in and reflect on whether you have good, pragmatic or potentially harmful motivations for helping other people. This is an important part of your self-development and your own self-awareness. And it may be that you need some help before you can help other people. The second area we looked at was about the importance of self-development and why it's so important in a helping profession. We looked at the model called the Johari window and how this helps us know ourselves and be open to others. And I talked about the various ways that you can increase that open window by receiving feedback, by listening to other people's observations and what they see in you that perhaps is hidden or unknown to you at this time. We also thought about the type of mindset we have. And as I said, even if you start with a fixed mindset, if you're brave and take the plunge, you can develop that growth mindset over a period of time. These are all very important aspects for you deciding on whether a helping or counseling career is the one for you. So before you start the next module, I strongly suggest that your self-development starts here and you have a little work to do. First of all, as I mentioned before, I've sent you a motivation questionnaire. This is important to fill in, so it gives you the opportunity to reflect and think about what this tells you about yourself. What are the reasons that you want to help others? And are there any areas of concern that you need to address? The second area of work is to think about the kind of mindset you have now. If you have a fixed mindset, think about what you can do to shift this into a growth mindset. 